Jen Gary is right here. There's Trey. Okay. Jen has been with SSU for 11 years. Um, she spent time both at the department level as well as central administration. Um, in her current role as program director for the Office of the Vice President for Research, she is responsible for reviewing all proposal budgets for all of the units that fall under the Office of Research. So she keeps very busy. Um, Trey, to my left, has been with Sponsored Research Administration the whole, is it the whole time? For yeah. five years? Okay. His current assignment includes handling all pre-award activities for the Mag Lab, the Coastal Marine Lab, and the Panama City Campus. Um, among others, in his capacity, he reviews and approves budget, proposed budgets submitted by departments. So he may be one of those people that looks at the budgets as they're coming into sponsored research. So two very good people to be talking about budgets today. Um, you don't need to hear any more from me, so I'm going to back out and let Jen and Trey take over. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've kind of, we've designed this for what we thought would best obviously serve the purpose of the mix of faculty and staff in the room, um, but I strongly encourage questions throughout. We don't go into great detail on every topic, but if we hit on something and it's something you have specific questions on, please feel free to ask. The more interactive we make this, the better it will be for everyone involved. Um, I'm not going to make everyone go around the room and introduce themselves, but we are going to do a little show of hands here. So if you are a faculty member, um, raise your hand. Okay. Good mix. And staff members? Okay. Any students? A couple. Awesome. All right. Cool. <laughs> well, welcome. So, um, like I said, we try to design this to hit everybody, but please feel free to ask questions. Now I'm going to wave this thing around until something happens. <laughs> uh, it, might, it might need to be turned on. I don't know if we can go on the side. Um, Power helps. There we go. All right. So we're going to go through the concept of building a budget. This is what I call when you've got that just blinking cursor, right? Like, okay, I want to submit a proposal. What do I need? <laughs> then we're going to talk about different types of costs, direct and indirect. Um, go through a little bit on calculating salaries and fringe benefits because those can get a little funky sometimes. Um, calculating indirect costs. And then we've got a couple budget exercises for you at the end. As you can see, we're not in a computer lab. We've built these to be kind of basic. We've got some calculators if you don't want to use the ones on your phone. Um, but we're just going to kind of walk through those so that you understand that, um, and then we'll give you one that you can work through at your table together. So like I said, you've got that blank screen in front of you, especially as a grant administrator. Your faculty's just come to you and said, I'm submitting this proposal. I need you to help me build a budget. So now what? So kind of look at this with the five W's is how I've approached it. So who do you need in order to execute what you're proposing for the project? Um, obviously, you're going to need a PI of some sort, whether they're getting paid or not. Co-PIs, this could be postdocs, grad assistants, subawards. Are you planning on subbing some of this out to another institution or entity that's going to do part of the work for you? So starting to build your personnel costs, thinking about who is going to be involved in the project. Then what do you need? Now, this one can be limitless, but for the sake of keeping you guys not here till 10 o'clock tonight, I've only listed a couple. Um, so what kind of supplies are there, you know, pipette tips that you need, do you need reagents, do you need um, administrative supplies that normally aren't included but could be because of the type of grant that you're working on. So what exactly do you need? Are there auxiliary services that you're going to have to pay for? Data analysis, screening, things like that. Um, publication cost, do you plan to publish your work? And then equipment, um, do you need any major equipment purchases? So we get into where. So do you need to travel to conferences to present your research? Do you need to travel to the field to conduct your research? And is the work going to be performed on campus in one of our labs um, or other facilities? Or are you going to be performing the work off campus? And that will play into the factor of indirect cost, um, in which we'll get into a little bit later. When, okay, this one's a little bit of a stretch, but I was trying to stick with my W's here. So how long is the project period going to last? Are you budgeting for a couple months? Are you budgeting for several years and we need to look at recurring costs? Um, so really looking at what that project period looks like. And then why, and this really gets into more of the budget justification. Um, and one thing I see a lot with faculty is that it's obvious to them because they do this type of work a lot, but it's not obvious to everyone else, either the grant administrator, sponsored research, or even the agency. So really spelling out why you need these supplies, go to this conference, publish these results, really putting that down, you know, down in, on paper. Pass the baton. 
Okay. Now we're going to talk about uh, direct costs versus indirect costs. A direct cost is an item that can be specifically identified for a particular project. It has to be reasonable, allowable, and allocable. So we've got some examples here. Salaries, so you can say how much time or effort uh, you're going to be committing to this project, and you turn that into salary dollars. Uh, any supplies, travel, publication costs, what we just touched on. An indirect cost, also known as research operating costs or FNA costs, or overhead, uh, we often use the acronym IDC for indirect costs. All of those are interchangeable terms, means the same thing. Um, so those are costs that can't be identified with a particular project, uh, but they're necessary to conduct the research. So examples are administrative support, general office supplies, we're talking like paper clips and reams of paper and toner, cartridges and things like that, uh, telecom and other utilities. Um, these are things that are really important to research, but it's hard to identify it specifically to a project, so those are all under indirect costs, and we recover cover those with our indirect cost rate, which we'll get into a bit more in a few slides. Okay, so salary and fringe benefits are usually take up a big chunk of the budget, and they're important. Um, they're based on FDE, your percent effort, person months, etc. And we've got an example of how to calculate an FDE here. Um, so it's the months on the project divided by your appointment months. So if you uh, have a 12 month appointment, then you would divide that by 12. If you have a 9 month appointment and you want to budget during the academic year, those 9 months, and divide it by 9. And then the 3 month summer term, you divide it by 3. If you have a 9 month appointment and you want to budget your salary during the summer months. This isn't the only way to do it. You can do it based on uh, pay period. So take your bi-weekly rate and multiply it by uh, the number of pay periods that you're wanting to do. And just for your information, we use 2.2 pay periods to equal one month. Um, the only thing is we encourage you to not use hourly rates when you're budgeting for your proposal. And especially if we don't want to submit it to the sponsor that way using an hourly rate because we don't maintain timesheets for sponsored activities and we don't want the sponsor to think that we can provide timesheets saying this PI worked this number of hours and, and have that be a, an official record because we can't keep official records like that. Um, again, this isn't the only way to do it, um, but as long as that's described in the budget justification how you've um, determined your salary, then uh, that, that's good. Um, a 3% uh, cost of living increase is allowed uh, yearly, and we do encourage that. Um, so you don't want to have a five-year project budget the same amount of salary for each year, and then your salary has increased. That'll eat into your budget over time. So do include a 3% cost of living uh, increase if that's allowed. There might be some sponsor that may not allow it, but um, most generally do. Um, Consider a nine month versus 12 month appointment and your health insurance. If you have a 12 month appointment, uh, you're gonna budget health insurance no matter when you're um, budgeting the salary. But if you have a nine month appointment and you're only looking uh, for a salary over the summer months, then you don't need to include health insurance in your budget because your health insurance is paid out during your nine month appointment. Now if you are looking to budget some time during your academic year and you have a nine month appointment, then do go ahead and include the, the health insurance there. But if you're just looking for summer salary, then you don't have to include health insurance. And you'll refer to the fact sheet for the current fringe rates. I think you have a copy of that in your handout. Um, that has a lot of really useful information for budgeting and other proposal um, general information on that. Um, it is updated fairly regularly, so um, don't take this and, and use it in six months because it will probably have been updated by then. It is kept on the SRA website. It's the Sponsored Research Administration website. Um, it, there's a, a link on the, the home page there. You can find the most up-to-date version. But at the bottom of the first page and the, the top of the second page has French rates and health insurance costs that you should use to budget. Uh, graduate students are considered salaried employees, and they're allowed up to uh, 0.5 FTE, which is uh, 20 hours per week. And that is considered full-time for graduate students, because they are uh, expected to take classes as well as uh, doing, completing their duties as a GRA. And note that their minimum wage is uh, $15.38 an hour. Um, but again, that's, that's usually determined by the, the department too, so use what your, your department rate is. 
Um, their fringe benefits are different from a standard faculty or staff fringe. Um, they use a 1.3% fringe rate, and then they also get a health insurance subsidy. If they're at a 0.5 FTE, that's $1,662. And that, again, is on the, the fact sheet. I think that's in the middle of the <coughs> page of the fact sheet. Um, if you are budgeting for a grad student and you need to include tuition, it needs to come from some source and that needs to be documented. Usually, the we ask for that tuition from the sponsor. Um, if you have some sort of limit on the amount of funding that you can request and your department or college is willing to cover the tuition, then that is okay, but that needs to be documented. Um, but again, generally, we um, budget for nine hours per semester uh, for a full-time grad student. And that's proportionate to their appointment. So if they have a less than 0.5 FTE, then you, uh, then you budget their tuition proportionally. And then tuition is currently escalated at 1% per year. We have that broken down on the fact sheet as well. I think that's at the bottom of the second page. Um, other direct costs, this runs the gamut. Um, equipment is uh, anything that is $5,000 or more with a useful life of one year or more. So if it's $5,000 but it has a useful life of less than one year, then it wouldn't be equipment. This is important because uh, it affects our indirect costs, and we'll, we'll see how that, how that works in a couple more slides. But um, note that uh, equipment should be budgeted appropriately so we can get the correct indirect cost calculation. Uh, travel needs to be in accordance with FSU travel policies. Um, and you differentiate between domestic and foreign travel. Um, so on your um, on your budget, you'll have a you should have a section for domestic and then a section for foreign, and have those broken down separately. And we need a detailed justification, um, so that should be a breakdown of anticipated transportation costs, anticipated lodging costs, um, per diem or meals. Because um, we sponsor research needs to be sure that you are budgeting in accordance with the FSU travel policy. So if you just give us a lump sum, then we'll come back and ask for some more detail. Um, participant support costs versus participant incentives. This is again important for indirect cost calculation because participant support costs are excluded from the indirect costs, whereas participant incentives are included. Um, participant support costs are stipends or fees paid to or on behalf of a participant or trainee, not an employee. You often see this if part of the project involves hosting a workshop and you're paying for folks from other places to come to the workshop. So if they if the grant will pay for their travel or for a stipend for them to attend the workshop, and that is considered a participant support cost. Um, a participant incentive is just uh, money, gift cards, etc., uh, to folks to participate in your study. And so again, this is important for uh, the indirect cost calculations. Um, other direct costs include tuition, which we've discussed, um, again, required for grad students. Um, materials and supplies, and this includes computers or equipment that's less than $5,000 or has a useful life less than one year. Um, publication costs, consultants, uh, subawards, again, if we're going to um, give some of that money to a different institution. <coughs> a good way to think about that is in a, a three tiered system. So we've got the, say, we're working with the National Science Foundation, they give FSU a grant, and then we subaward some of that to UF because there's a, a PI there who's um, uniquely qualified to help the PI at FSU with his research, and that would be a subaward from FSU to UF. Um, and then any other item that is specifically needed for your project, as long as it's not generally recovered as an indirect cost. Okay, indirect costs. So every about four years, we re, um, re renegotiate with the federal government. Our cognizant agency is the Department of Health and Human Services. Human Services, excuse me. Um, so we have to prepare a full proposal for them. This looks at all of the indirect costs that it requires, not just what's recovered on a proposal, but all of the indirect costs it takes to run the research enterprise here at Florida State. Um, then it also looks at our direct costs of what we've applied to actual projects, and that's how we determine the rate. So this is done in mutual agreement with the federal government, so it is approved by them. Um, we have multiple indirect cost rates, and you'll see that on that fact sheet. This can be based on sponsors, so whether it's a federal, a federal flow-through project, a state project, foundation, et cetera. 
Um, also location, that's what I touched on with travel. If you're performing the work on campus versus off campus, um, we only apply one rate to the project. So it's not to say that while you're in the field, those expenses are subject to one rate. And then when you're back in the lab, it's subject to another. Um, we make a determination whether more than 50% is going to be off campus. Um, and if rent will be paid to the facilities, then it would be an off campus rate. So we do not split the rates within the project. Um, and also project purpose. So we have a research rate, we have an instructional rate, and then we have other sponsored activities. So all of those, you know, if you look at the chart, you kind of have to do one of these numbers to figure out, you know, where you meet and what rate applies to the work that you're doing. And as I mentioned, they're all on the, the FNA on the fringe rate of the fact sheet. So we use two different bases. One of those is called a modified, oh, did you have a question? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you have one rate for the project? What if your project has different activities, or you said it's 54? Whatever there's most of is the rate it goes with? Correct. So when it comes to on-campus and off-campus, it's very specific that it has to be more than 50%. When it comes to, say, if you're trying to determine between research, instruction, or other, it is what we consider primary, um, but that hasn't been equated down to a number to say 50%. We just call it the primary purpose of the project. So we use two bases, and this is what Trey was talking about with your direct cost. So we have one that's called a modified total direct cost. You'll see this is MTDC. Um, and this is for our federal and federal flow through projects. Um, and then we have total direct costs, which is for our state of Florida. Obviously we have sponsors that don't fit either one of these and that we usually defer to the solicitation to see whether they take it as a total direct cost or a modified total direct cost. And what exactly does that mean? So, on modified total direct costs, there are several exclusions that we do not apply the indirect cost rate to. So you will see kind of a direct cost total, and then you will see, you know, an indirect cost base is what we'll usually see it on most budgets. Um, and they basically take their total cost and they've subtracted out equipment, tuition, rent, participant support costs. Subcontracts so gets a little funny because it's basically that we, we recover indirect costs on the first $25,000 of every subcontract on the project. It's not per year, it's one time. So if I'm doing subcontract that's a five-year subcontract, I'm only going to recover indirect costs on that first $25,000. If I've got five subcontracts on that project, I'm going to recover $25,000 on each of those subcontracts. So that can get a little tricky because you've got to do some manipulation there with your numbers to make sure you're only picking up that first $25,000 for each subcontract. And also our scholarships and fellowships, any stipends that are paid, um, we do not calculate indirect costs on those when it comes to modified total. Total direct cost. Oh, go ahead. So for the subcontracts, mm -hmm. if they are less than twenty-five thousand, the full amount we get. So the first twenty-five thousand we calculate indirect cost. So if it was only ten thousand, we would put it on ten thousand. We would calculate indirect cost on ten thousand dollars. So if it's more than twenty-five thousand, you just start at twenty-five thousand. You just calculate it for twenty-five. Correct. 000. So it was fifty thousand. Twenty-five of that would have indirect cost applied, and twenty-five of that would be excluded. Okay, so basically you want to encourage do not accept less than 25,000 subcontract. Um, you need to, you need to accurately, I wouldn't say that you should consider that for whether you're going to give them more than or less than 25,000. You need to give them an appropriate amount to execute the work that you want and them to do. Is 52%? 52% on federal, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now total direct cost, you would think that's all direct costs, but no. It excludes tuition, <laughs> um, and that's an FSU policy. We just don't calculate indirect costs on any tuition. So with total direct costs, we just back out tuition, and everything else would receive indirect costs. Two other topics I just wanted to touch on briefly because we get a lot of questions are cost share and funding caps. Um, FSU policy only allows for cost sharing when it is required by the sponsor. Um, only exceptions can be made to this by our Vice President Ostrander, so he, we can't just voluntarily commit cost sharing. Um, the uniform guidance that came out several years ago made a big push at the federal level that voluntary cost sharing is no longer considered in the merit review process. Because a lot of faculty think, well, if I show them I'm putting up some of our money, then they'll more likely to fund it. Um, and they're not allowed to consider that at the federal level. Um, so we do not allow voluntary cost sharing for the most part. And then funding caps. Um, you will see some solicitations that will include a cap. Sometimes they say approximately. So each award will be approximately $60,000. Um, sometimes they'll say that they cannot exceed that amount. If it says approximately, you can go over. That's really the PI's discretion to decide if they do want to go over, and if so, how much. Um, 
you can't really say as the agency whether they'll consider, oh, they've gone over too much and we're not going to fund it. That, that gets very subjective. Um, so that, that's kind of a PI call. Um, but you need to make sure that you can realistically perform the work that you're proposing. So if it's a $10,000 cap and you say, I'm sending a man to Mars, probably not going to happen for $10,000. So you need to be realistic about what you can do within the cap that they've, that they've opposed. Um, and there's a little formula I included. Basically, if your indirect cost is included in the cap, sometimes it gets tricky figuring out what I need to budget for direct cost versus what I need to leave available for indirect cost. So if you take your total cost minus any exclusions, so those are the things we talked about on that last slide, and you divide that by one point, your rate, which for this example I've used 1.52, that will tell you how much you need to budget in direct cost, which will tell you how much you have to budget in indirect cost. That'll be easier when you actually draw that out on paper than probably me trying to explain it to you, um, but it's just an easy formula if you're trying to determine this. So any questions at this point on kind of the general information that we've gone over? These are all budget experts. Okay, perfect. <laughs> all right, so we're going to run through a couple exercises. Um, you should have a form in your packet that says budget exercise, and it's a blank Excel sheet. Go ahead and pull that out. I promise this will be much more informative if you actually play along. So I'm not going to make you think too hard. Don't worry. through this with you, give you numbers and help you with the calculations. The second exercise, you guys are going to do this on your own. So if something doesn't make sense going through this, please ask questions. So we, oh wait, we need the um, PowerPoint for this, for them to be able to see the bullets. There. Okay, so this is, like I said, we're back to that blank screen, flashing cursor, your PIs come to you, or as the PI, you've decided that you want to submit a proposal um, and you need to put together a budget. So kind of now what? Um, so we're going to go through first and say, so the PI wants some salary, about a month. As Trey mentioned, we use 2.2 pay periods. So on that first line where it says annual salary, let's go ahead and assume $130,500 is the annual salary for this 12-month <coughs> faculty member. Do you want to write that in? $130,500. So to calculate the bi-weekly, and this is on a cheat sheet that you have in your in your handouts, but at Florida State we are on 26.1 pay periods, and that point one accounts for when we have leap year and when we don't have leap year and averages and all that. So you would take the annual salary divided by 26.1 to get your bi-weekly, which in this case is $5,000, which is why I chose the annual salary. And we want 2.2 pay periods because they want a month. So we're putting that in our pay periods. So now we're going to take our bi-weekly times our pay periods to get the total salary that we're requesting on this project. So in this case, $11,000. So everyone seeing that there? We took his annual, we turned it into a bi-weekly, multiplied by the number of pay periods we wanted. Now we know how much salary we're requesting on this project. Now, this PI happens to be on the ORP plan, which if you look at your fact sheet, and I want to show you guys this just so when you do the next exercise, I'm sorry. Um, at the bottom of page one, you'll see fringe benefit rates. And the second line there says ORP, that's the retirement plan. And all the way to the right is 19.03. So we're going to apply a 19.03% fringe rate. So then again, we're going to take the total salary requested for the project times our fringe rate to get our total fringe requested for the project, which is $2,093.30. And then this faculty is also on the individual. Yes, the individual health plan. So again, if you refer to your fact sheet, if I could flip my page. The top of page two, you'll see your various insurance rates, and it tells you how much you need to budget for a biweekly. So effective. 1117 an individual health insurance plan is 322 a bi-weekly. 
So that's what we're going to apply. So again, we're going to take our health insurance times the number of pay periods to get the total that we need for health insurance, which is 708.40. And now to get all the salary that we need to cover this faculty member, we're going to add the salary with the fringe, with the health, which is 1380170. So does that kind of make sense how you kind of have to, and, I, and you don't have to show all of this on your budget. I mean, you can, some people do this as one formula, kind of in one cell, but I wanted you to see kind of what all components that you're adding to that. Do we just keep going and keep going? Okay. <laughs> you're going to have that. All right, so now, your PI tells you that they need a grad student and they want them for the full year. So, again, for the sake of our exercise, let's assume a $26,100 salary for this grad student. So we're going to put that into that annual salary. We know to get their bi-weekly, we divide by 26.1, which I try to make easy math. So $1,000 bi-weekly. So then he said he wanted them for the full year, so that's that 26.1 pay periods. That's okay. So again, just to show our math here, it's like, you know, it's common core here. We've got to like spell it all out. Um, <laughs> so we're going to take our bi-weekly times our pay periods, which puts us back at that total salary of 26.1 since that's what his annual salary is. And then the fringe rate, which again, you go back to your fact sheet, your OPS students, which is what our grad students are, is a 1.3% fringe rate. So we're going to multiply that salary by that fringe rate, and it comes out to 339.30. And then with grad students, remember, we don't give them a recurring health insurance. They just get a one-time stipend. So since this is a full-time grad student, they're going to get the full 1,662 stipend for their health insurance. So again, to come up with that total salary that we're going to request, we're going to take their, their salary, their fringe, and their health insurance, and that gives you your 2810130. So we're just kind of working our way down it. So when you budget for a grad student, you also need to budget for tuition, yeah. <laughs> so we on your fact sheet, it'll tell you um, what the rates are for the grad students. At the bottom of um, page two, there's the tuition waivers. So let's just assume that this grant's going to pick up the full tuition waiver for the full year. So it's $11,004 in tuition. If you are using a waiver or something, you can spell that out here, but this grant's paying for everything. And then your PI told you, I'm going to need to go to a conference in California to present my findings. Well, it just so happens this PI went to California on another project that they did, so you go pull up that project and look and see what the costs were. So you want to have some sort of cost basis. Is it based on prior purchases? Is it based on quotes that you went out and obtained? In this case, we'll say, hey, he's gone to California before. It cost him about $1,200, so we'll budget $1,200 for him to go to California to present this time. Now, like Trey said, that does have to be detailed out. You know, $600 for airfare, $300 for lodging. You have to break that down, and it's got to add up. <laughs> I get budgets sometimes where the detail and the total don't match, um, so that's got to add up, but for this exercise, we're going to plug in 1200 He's not going anywhere foreign, so we're good there. Then he says, I need to purchase some supplies. i got to dig into that. That's a big box to unfold, because um, we can't just throw a random number in there. So what do you think you're needing for this project? So that kind of conversation happens so that they can start thinking. Again, you can pull up quotes. These can just be online, not to get you know three quotes for an item. It doesn't have to be anything <coughs> official. But again, having some sort of cost basis for how much you're needing to budget. Again, it could be prior purchases. I've purchased this 50 million times. I know this is how much it costs. So let's assume we talked and we figured out all the details and we're going to give them $3,000 in this budget for the supplies. And then they tell you they want to publish their findings. They tell you what journal they've published in this journal before, or you go on the website and you look up the journal rates. You think it's going to cost you about $600 <coughs> to publish your findings in, in journal XYZ. So we'll plug in $600 for them to publish their results. So now we're going to take this total direct cost. So we want to add up everything. We want to add up all the salary for the PI, for the grad student, the tuition, the travel, supplies. We're going to plug that into our total direct cost. 57707 is what that comes to. So does anyone remember with modified total direct costs what on this budget would be excluded? Tuition. That's this answer twice in a row. See, I'm trying to help you guys out. So 
We're going to take that 57 and we're going to subtract the tuition, the 11,004, and that's going to give us our modified total, which is 46,703. This is a federal project on campus, so we're going to apply a 52% indirect cost rate. So your 52% is going to be times this total here, your modified total. So that's 24,285.56. So then to get your total cost for the project, you're going to add your total direct cost with your indirect cost for your total. Be careful here, a lot of times I see that they use the modified total and the indirect cost to come up with the total, but that's just for the purpose of calculating your indirect cost. So you want to get your total direct cost, your indirect cost, and that gives you your total, which was 81,992.56. So I know that numbers might not have been the easiest thing to follow, writing all this down, this helps you can see them, but did the concept of kind of what you have to build into and walk through Makes sense. Can I at least get some nods or some couple of okay? Alright, alright. <laughs> okay, so now yes sir. Uh, if you were supporting the grad student just over the summer, uh -huh. is it is it just that fraction for the salary and the health insurance that you cover, or is summer different from semester? Um, no, it is. And if you look on the grad well, it depends on what How do you answer that summer part of health insurance? If the grad student has had a full appointment in the fall and spring, then usually their health subsidy has been paid through the in the fall and spring, the full 1662. So, so if you know your grad, if you know which grad student you're going to appoint, and you know that they've had a full appointment in the fall, the previous fall and spring, then their health subsidy should have been paid already. If you don't know which grad student you're going to appoint, then they may not have. And they may not have had health insurance, the health subsidy, then you should appropriate it based on the, the semester, the summer semester. Which I was going to say is on the fact sheet, you'll see where if they're appointed for the full 0.5 FTE, there's one supplement, and then if they're appointed for you know 0.25 to 0.49, there's another supplement amount. So it, that actually is prorated out for you on the fact sheet. You don't have to do that manually. For the Did you ask about tuition as well? So the tuition would be prorated, um, but remember that they have to take classes in order to be grad students. So if they were going to not take classes for the summer, they would actually need a non-grad student appointment. So they would need like a, a technician appointment. You'd have to actually convert them because they can't be a grad student if they're not enrolled in classes. And then that would be a different frame rate as well. They used the 2.75% yeah. versus the 1.3. Because I know there are some departments where grad students just don't take classes in the summer. So mm -hmm. they would be I asked Trey how he wanted to answer that because it's the common answer of it depends. <laughs> it's not always the answer. So, any other questions on that? Okay. So for the second exercise, you guys should have another one of those same blank budget exercise sheets, but you also have a budget justification, and this is basically the stuff. It's not the same, so I'll just copy your other budget because you're. I'm going to F on your grade today. But um, this basically outlines the same concept of what we just walked through. It tells you your PI. It tells you their salary. It tells you can decide how the table is going to do that. Do I have one? I'm not going to like pull them all up and anyone have to like show me their answers. But I'm going to work together. So if you guys want to take I don't know, the next 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, however long it takes you guys, we'll walk around and help. And you guys can work through the budget justification to fill out your budget. Pretty quick. So, and he wants to the full year. 
No, yeah, yeah. He saw the word budget. <laughs> All right, we're going to run through this. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to talk through it. And Trey's going to flip to the answer key for us so you guys can check your versions if you'd like to. Um, I know some of you are kind of working it all out, and others were just kind of thinking through some things. So, so I'm going to kind of budget justification and transfer this to the budget. So first one talks about the PI with an annual salary of 143.550. This is the same thing that we went through on the last one. So <laughs> we're determining a bi-weekly by dividing it by 26.1. They said they wanted two months, which I realize this wasn't on your cheat sheet, so I apologize. That was a real test for you guys. But we used 2.2 .2 pay periods for a month, so that's why we came up with 4.4 .4 pay periods for two months. Um, and then we said he had the FRS retirement package, which is the 18.57% fringe rate that you found on your fact sheet. And we said they had the family plan for health insurance, which is the 690 per pay period, again, according to your fact sheet. So running through all that math, you get your total cost of 31,729.94. So then down to the grad student. Um, you see TBD with grad students a lot because you don't necessarily want to name someone in case that student leaves, then you don't have to worry about that person was named in the proposal. So, you know, if it's a grad student, um, if it's not someone that's going to be key personnel, TBD works just fine even if you know who you want to appoint. Um, so, point of the project for the year, the point five is their full time. Um, the annual salary is 31,320. Again, divided by 26.1 to get your bi weekly. 26.1, we're multiplying it back together. <laughs> so your total salary, their fringe rate, 1.3%. So we multiply the fringe times the salary. Health insurance is 1662, because they're going to be appointed for the full year. Again, you'll notice on the fringe sheet, you'll see prorated. So if they're not appointed for the full year, or if they're appointed for less than a 0.5 FTE, you can pick up that number and add all that together. One comment to make we talked about during the presentation that you can have a 3% annual escalation. That's just on the salary, so you don't want to escalate the fringe and the health insurance. So make sure when you're applying that rate, that 3% across those years, that you're just multiplying that on the salary and your fringe and your health insurance rates are staying the same. Um, one other note on that, if you budget for 3%, but you don't actually have a 3% increase, you don't get to give yourself a pay raise. Um, you get paid at your actual institutional based salary. Um, most agencies, and again, the number one answer in research administration, it depends, but most agencies will allow that to be rebudgeted. Um, it would just whether it be you could do it without you know, prior approval from the agency or whether you had to go back to the agency. So you can build it in, but you don't have to give yourself a pay raise. Just a little disclaimer. Um, so we budgeted some tuition for the grad student. Again, fact sheet gave us that number, 11,000. Um, the travel, they said the PI and the grad student. I tried to italicize that. So I gave you the itemized cost per trip, but we multiplied that by two because both of them were going on it. So that's where the 3838 came from. Um, supplies, so 5000 they wanted to purchase some chemicals and some solvents. Threw that in there. Publication cost, they needed 500 for that. And then we're going to do a 52% indirect cost rate. So we took our total, we backed out our tuition for our modified, we applied our indirect cost rate, and then our indirect cost plus our total direct cost. So that's how that worked for that exercise. Any questions other on this exercise or in general? Yes, ma'am. So you said that the principal rates would be the same across the years regardless of the three percent Yes, so you're multiplying your fringe rate times the salary. So you're going to give that 3% escalation on the salary. So your salary is going to go from 
whatever this was. Okay. Um, they still do the new calculation. Correct. So we we'll just scroll back up so they can see that. Mm -hmm. So, saying, don't yes, so this number would get the 3%, but this is going to multiply times whatever that new range comes down to. So it's going to be higher, but sometimes we'll see people add 3% on to that. So. Any other questions? Yes. I thought there was something about publication costs were looked down upon or something because we're trying to open access. Is that based on, like, the funding opportunity or the federal versus um, I do know that we are trying to move towards more towards open access and sometimes I have seen people refer to publication costs as not necessarily just a scientific journal that they were public, you know, publishing in. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we're moving kind of to a new age. Um, but it's hard to say, you know, there's a lot of little subjective things like that where it's frowned down upon or encouraged. It's hard for us as research administrators to say, we can kind of give you our opinion based on the solicitation or based on the agency, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't want to make a general statement to say, no, we should be trying not to include publication costs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of gets field specific a little bit too. Yes? That could be a question you might want to ask the program officer. Yeah. Any other questions? So, what if you do calculation based on the out of the state, out of the state tuition, basically international students, then we hire domestic students. So is this something internal? Why don't we get the grant? Book? So, engineering is the only one that can budget for out of state tuition. Okay. Um, so, that's a little different to your department. I'm um, engineering. Yes. <laughs> so you can um, you can budget and then like I said most agencies will allow you to rebudget in that category without going back to the agency for approval um, some of them you may have to go back and get approval and rebudget it to somewhere else anything else well we hope this has been beneficial for you guys like I said we tried to kind of hit on a lot of high points but give you enough detail that you've got some takeaway um, if you guys have any questions I don't know if you guys have our email address but on your public on your PowerPoint and you can find us in the directory and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.